This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. to Wrestling Omakase. It is episode number 204. Uh, this week, I am very pleased to be joined by a returning guest from the One Wrestling Podcast. Hello, TJ. Hey, John. How's it going? Pretty good. Um, what's been up with you? Anything big? I mean... Uh, say it, was, it was my birthday this past weekend, oh, so... happy birthday. <laughs> uh, thanks. Uh, unfortunately, couldn't go out and do anything special, really, but uh, got to go uh, visit my in-laws for a Linux. They got vaccinated. <laughs> Lucky them. I'm still waiting for that. <laughs> yeah, I got my, um, I got my second one last Monday, so I'm pretty happy. Oh, uh, Philly's rollout of this thing is a, f- a total mess. I don't even want to get into it, but I'll get a, I'll get vaccinated eventually. But yeah, I got to go visit them at least and uh, see the new dog they bought. Or not bought, but rescued, I should say. <laughs> but so that's pretty much all I did this past weekend. And watch wrestling because i took a i basically pretty much took the whole week off the past week since uh probably like monday i mean i watched dynamite but other than that i haven't watched wrestling until yesterday oh wow so you had a lot to catch up with yeah, yeah i'm really behind in each big cup other than the show we're going to talk about uh, it's been a really good tournament but you know this actually this one was not really that great but uh the rest of the tournament's been really good but yeah um I, so it's funny you bring up your birthday. Like my birthday is May first, which I feel like is just going to be like just too early to do anything, basically. So, um, like I just feel like I'm I'm vaccinated. I know a few other people who are vaccinated, but most of my friends and you know my girlfriend Nicole and everybody are not yet vaccinated. So I feel like it'll just be a little bit too early to do any kind of birthday party. But what are you gonna do? Yeah, I'll say um. This is my second COVID birthday because I my, my birthday hit right after everything got shut down. Yeah, it was like the the day before my birthday is when like work was telling us we we're gonna be going home for a, a while. Yeah, and it's been a year now. So I mean, the people in like through March through like June, I think, or maybe March through May are gonna be the ones who get screwed with two COVID birthdays. Because I think obviously, if you were before this, you you had your one COVID birthday already, and then. Um, if you're after this, like I think starting in June, probably people are going to be able to start like having birth, like at least outdoor birthday parties for sure. I think. So, yeah. So if not indoor, if you're vaccinated and stuff, but yeah, I mean it's uh, it's rough being a March, April, and I think probably even May, uh, birthday. Mm-hmm. I think we're going to lose two of them. But what are you going to do? Um, are you a hockey fan at all, TJ? I don't know. I never asked you that before. I don't think. Uh, not really. I don't. I don't really watch sports that much, okay. honestly. Like I, I follow like football and like soccer, but beyond that, a little bit of like I'm mostly in like college basketball and stuff like that. But I, I don't really watch uh, sports that often. It's more just following scores and stuff. There you go. Well, hockey and baseball are, like the only two sports I really watch. And the uh, the hockey world got big news in the past week with uh, the NHL returning to ESPN, which I get wanted to mention because it's uh, it's pretty cool. I it's one of these things where like. I didn't realize how much I would be excited until it happened, I guess, because, you know, just on its, like, on its face, I'm like, oh, yeah, NHL return to ESPN. That's kind of cool. But once they start playing that old school uh, NHL National Hockey Night theme song, 
and like all the nostalgia from uh, my childhood when the NHL was on ESPN kicked in. It's like, oh yeah, this is pretty awesome actually. So I'm excited to see uh, the NHL return to ESPN. I thought Rich and Joe did a pretty good job covering this on the flagship this past week for two guys who are like don't haven't watched hockey since like I don't know 1995 or something. <laughs> so, but yeah, I just wanted to mention that because uh, I am excited. And I'm going to a hockey game on Wednesday, actually. So that'll be my first one in a very, very long time. But uh, that's like the first real, that's the first, I guess, uh, vaccinated privilege thing I'm doing. Is uh, my friend, my friend actually got two tickets to the Ranger game against the Flyers. And they require you to buy two tickets, I guess, as a minimum. Um, cause they're trying to make some money back after, you know, all these COVID shit. Yeah. I think it's only 2000 capacity right now in MSG. So not that many people, but you have to buy two tickets and, you know, he, he basically had to buy these two tickets, but he, you know, all of his, most of his friends are not vaccinated yet. So it was like, Hey, I know you got vaccinated. Do you want to go? And I was like, you know what? That sounds awesome. So, uh, but I still had to go get a fucking, I had to get the PCR test on Sunday. Because the state of New York requires you to get a test before you uh, go to the game. So it was kind of a pain in the ass. Like you have to find this, like MSG teamed up with this specific clinic that guarantees you'll get your results in exactly three days. Because they have to be done three days out from the game. But like, obviously the results have to be back before you go to your game. And like all the, like there's a million local clinics around me that I could have walked to that are offering, you know, PCR tests, but they all say three to five days. So it's like, well, okay, the mm-hmm. three days would have been fine, but then I'm really rolling the dice. If it's four or five days, then, uh, you know, I can't get in. So I had to go to this, like, one specific, like, uh, you know, walk-in health clinic that's, like, it was, like, a 15-minute Uber ride away and, like, over in Queens. So kind of pain in the ass. What are you going to do? Uh, it's worth it, I guess, just to get out of the house. And I imagine at some point they'll just, like, take proof of vaccination instead of making you get the test still, but they haven't done that yet. So now that'll be exciting. My first, I think that's my first live hockey game in like, even like two seasons. I don't think I went even before COVID started. Just like one of these things where like, I feel like after this shit is finally over, people are going to like want to do all sorts of stuff that they weren't doing even before COVID started. Just cause it's like, just fucking get me out of my house and let me uh, do anything at this point. Like, I don't know. I just feel like everybody's going to be like, yes, I'll take, I'll do anything. Or even stuff I didn't really think of most that much before COVID. You know, I just want to, you know, I have the desire to do it all of a sudden after being locked in my house for over a fucking year. Yes, I'm definitely ready to go and do stuff. I'm like, (laughs) I haven't, it hasn't bothered me as much as that seems like a lot of other people are like staying stuck in your house because that's kind of what I pretty much always did. I barely went out really. But I'm definitely ready to go do some stuff, go to some wrestling shows finally. Um, I'm really excited to actually go to a normal gym instead of like this little tiny one in my apartment. Yeah, just any, but, anything really. I'm, I am I started yeah. planning out my Japan trip for this year. Uh, just like, you know, really in like the ultimate optimism, I guess. Because it's like, obviously, I don't know if I'm going to be able to go. Like the plan was to go for, uh, for Wrestle Kingdom finally in December. And... You know, hopefully I can go, but it would well, shock me if I can't know, especially because they're not opening for the fucking Olympics, which I kind of figured they would. But, uh, you know, it's just like, um, you know, so but I started planning out those dates anyway, because it's like, you know, I want to at least pretend I'm going, <laughs> you know, but like, uh, or have that optimism mm-hmm. that hopefully I can go. But, you know, if I can't go, I can't go. I'll just, you know, maybe hopefully I can go in like April 2022 or something go for uh cherry blossom season again but i'm hoping i can go for wrestle kingdom finally because it seems pretty cool i've never done it somehow i've gone three times and never gone for wrestle kingdom so it just feels like one of these things i should finally do but but yeah i don't know i'm, I'm kind of like it's one of these things i'm planning because i want to plan like i'm gonna go but on the other hand, I'm not particularly hopeful with the the news that they're not like allowing any foreign fans for the Olympics because like I kind of had in my head like okay, well if the Olympics happen, then that will be their impetus to open. But the Olympics are happening and they're not going to open, so I don't know. Like at that point, it seems like well, I don't know, you know, they might they might just wait like a really long time to reopen it to any kind of tourism then. So 
Yes, I'll be curious because I haven't really been keeping up with like the vaccination rollout in Japan. It's but been horrendous. I feel like at least the U.S. Yeah, it's been horrendous in Japan. They have they've they've vaccinated like thirty thousand people so far. Oh wow, yeah. <laughs> that's nothing. Yeah. So uh, if anyone's but, everyone's but... hoping for the end of clap crowds anytime soon, uh, you got a long time to go. I think, unfortunately. But yeah, the U- yeah, because so I feel like at least to the U.S. we'll be able to travel out of the country potentially here by the end of the year. It's just you think will other countries be good enough yeah. to let us in? I guess. Yeah, you think if they want to like, I mean, if they want to do some kind of program where you have to be vaccinated to get in, it's fine with me. And I got my vaccine card here. I'm like, look, let me in. All this shit, like the the new, I have the Pfizer vaccine, which like there's all this new shit out that like uh, vax people with that vaccine can't even spread it asymptomatically it's like not, it reduces even asymptomatic infections by 94 percent. oh wow yeah so um you know i don't know it just seems like you know i'm vaccinated i have lots of money to spend after not doing anything for the last year do you want me to come and spend some money in your country come on but uh <laughs> yeah we'll see i guess um but yeah so we're here to talk about three shows today uh, the New Japan Cup Night 9, the All Japan Dream Power Series, uh, Korokin from March 14th, New Japan Cup from March 15th, All Japan Korokin from March 14th, and DDT Daydream Believer also from March 14th. Uh, some good wrestling over the weekend, I will say. Some really good stuff on all three of these shows. Uh, actually, not so much the New Japan show, but uh, the other New Japan uh, New Japan Cup shows lately have been really good. This is probably like the weakest in a, in a while. Um, but the All Japan, the DET shows both had some really strong stuff that we will get into here. Uh, but let's kick off with the New Japan, New Japan Cup Night 9, March 15th. And this is where I should mention, again, if you're not a Omakase patron, uh, I am doing daily coverage of the New Japan Cup shows. So this week alone, I did uh, daily shows for patrons on Tuesday... Wednesday, uh, or was it, there was a day off in here somewhere. I don't even remember what the day off was. Uh, it might have been Tuesday, actually. Yeah, so like I did daily shows on the pa- on the Patreon on a Wednesday, Thursday, uh, Saturday, and Sunday, I believe. I should have looked this up first, but uh, yeah, so I did I did a lot of daily shows. Is the point? Uh, yeah, so March 9th. Okay, so the day the one day off is Friday. So I did Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, a lot of Patreon exclu- or Patreon exclusive audio, uh, you know, daily coverage covering all, all the New Japan Cup tournament matches in detail. Uh, some really good stuff. You know, the the match that everybody's going crazy about right now, the Osprey Zack Saber Jr. match, which was from yesterday's show, uh, the March fourteenth, the Sunday March fourteenth show. Um, you know, I I I like that match a lot. I went four and a quarter stars on it. I did not go five stars on it, though, which I've seen a lot of people going on it. And I think there's a couple reasons why it's not really a five-star match of the year level match, in my opinion. So if you want to hear those, I guess, hot takes, because it seems like a lot of people are going five stars on it, uh, you can hear them right now at patreon.com slash wrestling omakase. And again, all the audio from this week is up there. All the first round stuff, second round stuff, uh, you know, basically every New Japan Cup show that we don't talk about on the free feed because uh, we did night three last week, and we did we're doing night nine here right now. Obviously, it's all on the Patreon. Uh, we'll be continuing it all week long. Um, I believe there's what before the finals. I think there's still four more shows, right? Yeah, the quarterfinals and or, or three more shows. So two quarterfinal shows and a semifinals. So we'll be covering all of that on the Patreon this week. So yes, definitely check out Patreon.com/slash Wrestling Omakase. And only five dollars, you get all your daily New Japan Cup audio. Uh, I'll, you can hear my top ten matches of the tournament so far. Uh, a ton of other stuff. So definitely check that out. And we're doing coverage of the uh, New Japan Cup Pick'em because we did, of course, our own wrestling omakase uh, Pick'em, which got fifty-eight entries. So I've been updating the standings of all that each day, and you know who people picked because it is really entertaining seeing who who people. Uh, you know, how many people thought who was going to win this match or that match. So, you know, we'll update that again after we get through these uh, tournament matches here. But, yeah, I'm, I'm close to winning, actually. I'm only two points behind uh, the current leader. So we'll get into that. Uh, did you do any kind of pick them this year, TJ, in any of these contests? I know you didn't do it in mine. Uh, no, I, I sat this year out. I mean, I'm, I wasn't super excited about the tournament, to be honest. Yeah. 
like that's from what I've seen, I've enjoyed. It's just yeah, and I I didn't really have any idea really who was gonna win. I kind of have an, some ideas now. It's gonna but be Shingo. If you're going in, I was. That's kind of where I'm leaning yeah. to. Did, I think he's at least gonna be in the final. That new but... theme song is a giveaway to me. The, the theme song remix when he when he came out with that against Okada, it's like oh yeah, he's winning this match and he's winning this whole tournament probably. But and it keeps up with the Kota Ibushi runs through Lij thing. So yeah, it's gonna be like even before anything happened. That's kind of who I was leaning towards anyway, just because they seem to be setting up the match like a couple months ago anyway. Yeah. I mean, to me, like you know, Shingo, I could see Osprey. Um, you know, those are like the two, and I, I, I kind of think that's going to be the final, but I guess we'll see. Uh, but yes, so the show here, the March 15th show from Cork and Hall, it opened up, or the main event actually, we'll start at the top and work our way down, was Jay White defeating Hiroshi Tanahashi in 1954 with the Blade Runner to move on to the quarterfinals. Uh, Tanahashi, you know, got, gets that buy out of the first round for being never champion and then loses in his first match. Um, I don't know about this match. This match was pretty disappointing for me. I mean, I, I went three and a half stars on it. Um, there, Jay White, I, he just really has not been clicking with me since returning, uh, you know, from his little, you know, self-imposed exile after Wrestle Kingdom. Like, I, I sort of agree with the, the crit, critique I've seen around that, like, you know, he he feels like he's stuck in neutral and it feels like, he should be past this already. Like we, the, the Kota Ibushi loss was the culmination of this character, and now it just kind of feels like we're just retelling the same story. And I don't know his heat segments lately. Like I really didn't like it against Hinare. Here it was a little better, maybe, but it just felt kind of endless. And you know, it just he really hasn't been landing me a ton, landing with me a ton in this area lately. Um, you know, the, the finishing sequence like it leads to a decent back and forth finishing sequence but like it just didn't feel you know worth the amount of time it took to get there especially since it was kind of it was kind of short by uh you know big new japan match finishing sequence standards um you know the finish was kind of, was pretty clever with jay white countering the dragon screw attempt straight into the blade runner he basically like doesn't go down for the dragon screw and just like lifts tanahashi straight up and hits the blade runner off of that and it's a 100% clean win, which I feel like he needed at this point because the, the Gato stuff was starting to get pretty excessive with him. But, you know, I it's just like, I don't know. I just didn't didn't love this. It was good, but it really, like, you know, the, to give it context for this tournament, I mean, I have, you know, out of 22 matches, this match ranks uh, 13th for me. I mean, it doesn't even touch my top 10. There's been a lot of really good stuff in this tournament. I mean, seven matches at four stars or better, and then another four matches at three and three quarters. I mean, there's been a really good tournament so far, I think, and this match was well below a lot of it. So just, you know, just really kind of disappointing for these two guys. Uh, you know, these there's always been a pairing I've enjoyed in the past. You know, they've had some really good matches, like the, uh, the match they had when Tanahashi returned from his injury at uh, the Best of Super Junior Finals in 2019. That was pretty awesome. The uh, the match they have for the briefcase in 2018 in uh, King of Pro Wrestling was great. Uh, I mean, this this was probably better than that Wrestle Kingdom match they had when Jay first came back with the character. But uh, other than that, I don't think it was really like, you know, one of their better matches or anything. I don't know. What'd you think? Uh, yeah, I enjoyed it, but I definitely see where you're coming from like on it like didn't feel quite like a cork and main event really it felt like something on like some random house show like if this had happened on like this show where um i like osprey and uh zach happened at a little, a little like a smaller venue uh the post match to me the big thing here was you know jay white's been saying you know he's gonna win the tournament and split up the titles again uh if he beats koda which you know i don't think he's gonna win the tournament anyway but he did mention that tanahashi should hand him the never title to add to his collection of belts after he wins the tournament and that to me was like a little bit of an early build f to indicate they're probably going to do a tanahashi versus white never title match off of this uh for one of the 500 shows coming up after the new japan cup so uh, maybe that's why this wasn't great or anything maybe they're holding something back for that but you know it's uh it wouldn't surprise me if this is a I don't know. You, it could be Sakura Genesis. It wouldn't shock me if it was like one of the Dontaku Knights or something. 
I mean, they have a million shows they got a they got a headline. So I mean, there's two Duntaku nights and there's a uh, two other nights in uh, Kagoshima that are like titled shows. Uh, you know, kind of like the Hino Kunis used to be. But I guess we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, they're trying to elevate the belt. Yeah. Yeah, they're trying to elevate the belt, but it does feel... I agree with you that it feels really weird to have Jay White be like, yeah, the Never title. I'm like, well, okay. <laughs> That's a little... But yeah, I mean, the belt is supposed to be the number two belt now, like you said. Uh, the semi-main event, also in the New Japan Cup second round, David Finley defeats Yoshihashi in 13-12 with the acid drop uh, to advance to the quarterfinals. This was good. I mean, you know, it was maybe a little better than I expected it to be. It's not anything like that's going to blow your mind or anything like that. I mean, it was pretty dull early on. Just like, you know, these two guys, especially early, just, just, they don't have like the fan interest, I guess, to like just draw people into their match, you know, just from the start. And like, it did feel kind of like, you know, just watching two guys go through the motions and just do moves for a little bit. But, uh, you know, just felt like it took a while to get out of first gear. But the intensity really picked up. I mean, got like a big physical elbow exchange, uh, some hard chops, and, you know, Yoshihashi like did this big roar and uh, gave this great kneeling super kick and a somewhat out of control Liger bomb, but where he like looked like he was going to drop him, but like it kind of worked and made it look cool. So that's fine. Uh, and I got a two count. That was like right before the 10 minute call. Uh, unfortunately, he went right from that to the butterfly lock, <laughs> which that move sucked so bad, but it wasn't the finish. And they had a really hot finishing stretch. A lot of close near falls. Uh, Finley, especially, I thought, did a really good job during this sequence, telling that he was on his last legs and, you know, didn't have much left in the tank. And the the finish, where he got this great spinning stunner counter uh, to counter Yoshihashi's, like, signature brain buster thing he does, and then immediately followed up with the acid drop of the pin. Uh, it was really cool, I thought. And, you know, I got... It got good enough by the end that I went three and a half on this as well, even though... I thought it was pretty boring early on, like I said. But, uh, you know, they really turned it on by the end and had a f pretty fun match. And it sets up Finley versus Jay White in the uh, in the qu in the the uh, quarterfinals, which is, a, you know, a pairing they haven't done in a while, but it used to be a, you know, it's kind of that, that young lion that young lion feud going way back, so. Uh, Yoshiyashi get knocked out already because he, um, I've been enjoying him a lot the past year, so. But, yeah. I was interested to see if uh, Finlay was going to randomly show up with the Impact Tag Titles since they won them yeah. over the weekend. I was curious if they I packed them they up in their suitcases them. or not. Uh, so Finley, so the Finley and Jay White thing. So White is 10-1 and one against him, but they haven't wrestled since their U.S. title match all the way back on April 24th, 2018. That was their last singles match. So that'll be interesting to see, you know, uh, these two guys who used to meet all the time face off for the first time in you know almost three years so that'll be pretty cool uh so yes those are your two tournament matches we'll go we'll go uh we'll go quickly through the undercard here uh match three was sonata shingo and bushi beating yuji nagata Hi hiroki goto and ryusuke taguchi uh sonata pinned taguchi in 626 with the o'connor bridge um i didn't love this one i mean it was pretty it was pretty short anyway uh, you know, it ended via that cradle exchange. Taguchi and Sonata were just like, you know, like I said, exchanging the cradles, and Sonata came out on top at the end. But, you know, not much else to it to me. I went like two and a half stars. It was all right. Yeah, uh, Matt didn't really, really like Marvel <laughs> on Fire or anything, but uh, it felt like they were just trying to rush through everything and get out and get in and out yeah. as quick as possible. Like, I, I kind of enjoyed the Taguchi and Sonata stuff at the end, but it was them exchanging pinfalls attempts, so in cradle so it wasn't a whole lot of anything but at least there's a positive about the match for me uh match two was the um, united empire will osprey jeff cobb and great okan beating the dangerous techers and canon maru cobb pitting canon maru in 710 with the tour of the islands uh it was nice of the united empire to even show up for this match after tai chi destroyed their whole life basically in that backstage promo he did a couple nights ago. Uh, he basically said they're the lamest units out of all the many units in wrestling history. Like, he was like, oh, wrestling has had so many units. 
in the entire course of its history, and you guys might be the lamest of all time. And he's like, I don't even understand what your theme is. I don't know what you're trying to do. It was just a really just, like, he buried them. It was like, okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was just a really kind of funny promo. Uh, and Taichi ran wild with choking on everyone on the Empire team. I was worried for a second he was going to choke B Priestley too when she got up on the apron, but thankfully she ran away. I was not ready for that discourse if that had happened. Uh, I definitely, definitely tried like, to. He didn't like. He didn't like even act like he was about to. He just kind of like walked menacingly towards her, and she like ran for the hills. So I'm like, you know what? Good, good. I'm glad we didn't do that spot. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and Cobb deadlifted Kanemaru up for the tour of the islands, straight up from the mat. Uh, that was pretty cool, but I thought this match was just fine. Nothing that special, you know, two and three quarters. They, none of these matches had a ton of time because they're they're rushing through this. You know, they're, they have to rush through through these whole Corrigans because of the, uh, you know, the state emergency curfew is still going. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, you know, this show started six and then, uh, you know, they they have to be done by eight basically. But you know, I think DDT ran long actually on their last one. Thinking about it, but. Uh, you know, I don't know what the punishment is if you run long, but cle- clearly New Japan's trying not to. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, you know, not a ton to say about it besides, uh, you know, the Taichi stuff. And I guess it sounded like in a backstage promo yesterday that the Techers are going to go back to challenging for the tag title soon. So I guess we're getting another Techers G.O.D. match, which, uh, you know, I love the Dangerous Techers, but I can't say even I'm that excited about that. Yeah, so I was really hoping for a Okan uh, Tai Chi match coming out of this because I thought they had some good interactions in this match, even if it was like short lived, and them getting like in their in each other's faces after the match. And I kind of thought the finish was going to be like uh, I think it's like Kanemaru did this like spinning DDT on Cobb, and I thought with all the gifts I've been seeing of Cobb doing all this like jug- basically juggling Watto, I thought that was going to be the finish because I figured he's going like, to catch Kanemaru and hit this tour of the islands, but. I do think that, like the finish of like deadlifting him off the ground, off the mat, and then hitting it was a little bit better than that. But yeah, not a whole lot about not, it, was, it was fine. Uh, and the opener match. was the team of Minoru Suzuki, El Desperado, and Doki defeating Kenta, Taiji Ishimori, and Jado. Desperado pinning Jado in 802 with the numero dos. Um, you know the big things here. It looks like Suzuki and Kenta uh, still very much have a few going, judging by their backstage comments lately. They went really hard at each other with a strike exchange at one point, and you know they got into each other's faces after the match as well. So clearly not going to finish off with that uh, New Japan Cup match. Going to keep this feud going. And I thought this was a uh, no. Desperado tapped Jado out. Duh, the numero dos is uh, his submission finisher. But yeah, this was a fun and energetic opening brawl. Definitely the highlight of the undercard for me. I think part of it is like Bullet Club versus Suzuki Goon. At least like because you know obviously Bullet Club has been. Uh, kind of drive me crazy on some of these past shows. But, like, Bullet Club versus Suzuki Goon still feels at least kind of fresh because they really avoided that pairing for a long time, even though both units have been around for a while. It feels like last year was, like, you know, late last year was the first time they really even did any feuds with that, or, you know, at least the first time in a very long time. I mean, I remember they briefly did, like, Killer Elite Squad against, uh, you know, Carl Anderson, Doc Gallows, they had a Wrestle Kingdom tag title match, I think. But for the most part, they really avoided, you know, those two units facing each other as the two big heel units. And now, as we've talked about a million times, with United Empire kind of becoming the new second heel unit, you know, Suzuki Goon's in much more of a neutral position now. Um, you know, so they're they're able to feud, I guess, more Bullet Club and stuff. So yeah, that still feels kind of fresh as opposed to, you know, Bullet Club versus Hauntai Chaos, the fucking really which is really the same thing at this point or even bullet club versus lij which has been fucking you know running to the ground over the years too but yeah i went three stars on this this was pretty fun yeah i thought it was pretty fun too jotto didn't move too bad even though he can't walk but i thought he moved pretty well in this match compared to like honma for example but uh yeah it wasn't it was a fun little opener and uh not sure I'm in love with the idea of it seems like Ishimori is challenging for the junior title because, I mean, it'll probably be a right match, but I'm not exactly thrilled about that. But I'm definitely excited for another uh, Suzuki and Kenta match, even though I haven't seen the New Japan Cup match it's yet, so good. I don't know if that was any good or not. But Yeah. 
Sounds like yeah, it went, sounds like a good pairing. What rating I gave it? I think I gave it three and three quarters. Yeah, so it was really good. Three and three quarters. Uh, you know, and it felt like they left something on the table too, where you know they can do another match. Uh, so yeah, that'll do it, I guess, for New Japan. Not a ton to talk about in this show, honestly. You know, like I said, the the New Japan Cup's been really good if you haven't been watching it, but this was probably one of the weakest nights of the entire tournament. So I mean, it was still two good matches. So it's not like you know it was a bad show or anything, but like you know, compared to some of the other nights, I mean, you know, there's been like really high end stuff in this tournament. You know, neither of these uh, matches was really at that level. Uh, I'd say at least with uh, the fact that all these shows basically took place in the same weekend, I am happy that this is like one of the shorter <laughs> Japan Cup, Cup so, shows because like all yeah. the matches were pretty. Slim. So coming up this week, and again, all of this can be you can hear our daily coverage of all this on the. Wrestling Omakase Patreon, patreon.com slash Wrestling Omakase. Uh, so tomorrow it starts the quarterfinals, Evil versus Toriano, uh, oh boy, and Shinko Takagi versus Kenta, which, I, you know, I, I, I talked about this a lot on the Patreon. This is not only their first ever singles match, it's their third meeting period. They've only ever met twice in their entire careers. It's kind of crazy. Uh, the GHC Junior Tag Title match from Dragon Gate in 2008 which is obviously a long time ago. And then in their entire time together in New Japan so far, they've met they've met in one 10-minute tag from World Tag League 2019 uh, when it was Shingo and El Terrible against Kenta and Yujiro Takahashi. So yeah, definitely a fresh matchup here. You know, they've stayed... They've somehow managed not even to face each other in these undercard tags all this time, which I don't even understand how that's possible in this company. But that's what Cage Match says, so... Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, so that's tomorrow, so... Uh, you know, and Thursday in Shizuoka is the other half of the quarterfinals. Uh, Will Ospreay versus Sonata and David Finley versus Jay White. Saturday in Sendai has the semifinals. Uh, the the winner of Evil Yano against the winner of Shingo Kenta. And the Osprey sonata winner against the Finley White winner. So all three of those shows, again, covered on the Patreon at patreon.com slash wrestlingomakase. And then the finals will be next Sunday, March 21st. That we will, we will cover... Uh, back here on the free omakase so we'll cover the finals next week uh looking at the omakase pickums let's see what people predict for these quarterfinals so the first two uh you know so we have 58 people that entered uh 31 of them chose evil zero have chosen toriano to move on to the semifinals and the other the remaining 27 had picked somebody you know who was uh already eliminated to get through this quarter of the bracket and then very similar in the other quarterfinal on that side of the bracket, 37 people picked Shingo Takagi, zero picked Kenta to move on to the semifinals. Uh, and, you know, the remaining 21 had picked someone else uh, to get out of this quarter of the bracket. The other quarterfinals here, also very one-sided, 49 people picked Will Ospreay, five picked Sonata. Uh, and again, the remaining four would have gone with somebody else. And 48 people picked Jay White to get out of this quarterfinal, zero picked David Finlay. So, uh, you know, not, if, if there's any, any upsets in those three matches, nobody's getting points for it in my pick'em. Uh, the only one, you know, there's some people who think Sonata will get past Osprey, and, you know, those people will have a lot of, uh, a, a big bit of an advantage against everybody else. But yeah, Jay White, I mean, those four are the same four I picked. Honestly, I picked White, Os- White Osprey, uh, Evil, and Shingo. And then, you know, I have Shingo beating Evil and Osprey beating White. And then I have the Osprey and uh, Shingo final with Shingo winning. So we'll have to see what happens. As far as the standings go, uh, Chris Samsa, who was on here last week, he is leading our Peckhams with 30 points. Uh, I believe the most points you could have right now. So he he's gotten he got all 16 matches in the first round right, or 14 matches plus the two buys. And he got 7 out of 8 of the second round. So, you know, the most points you could have is 32 points. So he's only he only got one match wrong. So congrats to Chris. He's done really well through the first two rounds. Uh, and then there's a few people with 29 points. Uh, it looks like one, two, three, four, five, six. Six people with 29 points right behind him. And then two more people with 28 points, uh, yours truly. And also Sean Cedor from Voices of Wrestling. They are also right behind. So those are, you know, the, the people who are very much in the mix here. Uh, a lot of other people, a few other people with 27 points. You know, 26, 25, uh, and then really gets down to the basement here. 
where my buddy Aaron has had four points this entire time. He got four matches, or he got two matches right in the first round, and that's all he got, and he hasn't gotten any right in the second round. I guess it's hard to get anything right in the second round when uh, you only got two matches right in the first round. But yes, uh, Aaron, I think you got last place sewn up there, buddy. I assume when he did that bad, he must have done it on purpose, uh, but who knows. And then second to last place, the uh, English young boy announcer Mavs Gillis with 14 points. Uh, he only got 10 matches right in the first round and two right in the second round. So, uh, yeah, the that's bringing up the rear. And in third to last place, August Baker from Voices of Wrestling. So uh, a star-studded bottom of the bracket here. And the, <laughs> August has 15 points. So there you go. And, of course, the prize is a free month of the Omikaze Patreon. So uh, if you do win this bracket, if you do win the or the Pick'em, uh, if you're already a patron, you just get your five bucks back for one month. And if you're not a patron, uh, you know, you get your five bucks back once you sign up. So pretty much how it'll go. We'll see who gets the who uh, gets the inaugural crown in the Wrestling Omikase uh, New Japan Cup Bracket Challenge. All right, let's move over to All Japan Pro Wrestling. Uh, they had a Korkin show on Sunday, March 14th in their Dream Power Series. So this was like... The second televised night, I believe, of the tour. Could have been the third, maybe. But the big thing here, to me, is obviously the uh, the brand new heel unit. The Total Eclipse unit, which is basically Jake Lee and Tajiri, uh, along with all the on funds, except for, uh, obviously, uh, oh god, I'm blanking on his name all of a sudden. Uh, Shatar Ashino, of course. And, you know, Ashino looked really good and pissed off here, so that was good. But also, like, this was my first time seeing the Total Eclipse gear, which they debuted a few shows ago on, a, I think, a Shinkiba show I didn't watch, and the Total Eclipse music, and that was really great. And, you know, just a really, really great start, I think, for Total Eclipse. And, you know, you have a, an awesome main event here, as we're going to get into in a second, uh, along with, you know, some really cool stuff on the undercard with, you know, Total Eclipse, you know, getting getting started here and looking pretty hot. And, yeah, All Japan, you know, I, to me, the... The headline for All Japan here is they've really pulled this thing out of the ditch. I mean, I'm not really to say they're having some kind of new fucking boom period or anything, but like, you know, the second half of 2020, I gave up on them in like November. I was so fucking sick of that promotion. I think a lot of people, judging by, you know, the stuff that came in in my uh, Omakase year end awards and stuff, I mean, they were like the number two, like, negative promotion when it came to like worst promotion and all that stuff to WWE. And obviously nobody was catching WWE in any of those negative awards. But, like, yeah, they were the other promotion that people, you know, really had a lot of negative feelings on, you know, at the end of 2020. And I think for good reason. I think, you know, people were really, um, whether it's Suji Ishikawa or Tajiri or both of them, uh, you know, people were really fed up with the booking in this company. And I don't know. It feels like they, um, like, one change of that, you know, you can't really say, like, one big change of that level is cures everything that's wrong with the company but like it really has helped a ton i mean and jake lee looks great as a top heel i mean he looks like the kind of thing he was born to do honestly it makes them look silly that they didn't really try this before and you know actually know looks great as a pissed off baby face and uh, you know just it's the kind of thing where like a, sometimes a double turn can really solve a lot of promotion a lot of a, a, a promotion's problems and i think that was very much the case here i don't know do you have any thoughts tj before we get into the show yeah, I'll say I was one of the people that voted for Gold Japan in your awards for like worst promotion of the year, but I think I was the one I was we were talking about it on that episode of the year end awards. I was saying it wasn't like actually the worst one, it's just the one that pissed me off the most because they had like won me over the during the no people era, like when there was no fans, all their all their TV yeah, was all, the, the amazing. Yeah, the first half of their year and then was good, as, and that's what you're talking about with the uh, with the no fan stuff. It was like when the fans came back, the fucking promotion fell off a cliff. Yeah, pretty much. But I think that, like you said, I think they've had a strong start to the year, even even without like the total eclipse shit. I think they started off the year with some really strong Corkins, and then with this Jake Lee turn, it just added some fire that the promotion really needed. There's, I think there's other stuff too. Like I think turning Purple Haze not into like mid card heels and actually kind of being like top end heels and having like not being all cheating and stuff all the time. It was like them just being basically being ass kickers. Like they're still they cheat a little bit, but it's not as bad as like first half of 2020 when they first debuted and <laughs> I just wanted to not see them really. 
at all whenever they were on my screen, but now they're like one of my favorite factions in the promotion. But I love this turn for Jake Lee. Like, uh, again, Fonts is like one of my favorite stables, so I'm sad to see them kind of done now. And I don't have as high hopes for Ashino as uh, you do. I think he's yeah. kind of basically Goto now. He's just not going to do a whole lot. Like, hopefully I'm wrong, but I don't have high hopes for him. But for the rest of the Infants guys and for Jake Lee especially, I think this is going to help all of yeah, them they... a lot. Hopefully they uh, actually go with yeah. him at the end of this. But right now I think they're doing everything right with this faction. Yeah, they so look, I'm really they just happy look about really, it. really, like, reinvigorated. So, I mean, that's really how it comes down to it. I think what you – I'm glad you brought up Purple Haze because it's like – Having this new unit that's clearly, clearly, clearly like the heels of the company has really let Purple Haze kind of pull back a little bit and be more like, you know, in the role of like a neutral style unit or, you know, just less, less heelish. And, you know, I think it fits them better. So, you know, I, I think it, it the, like doing this, like having a new strong heel group since they, they clearly were not willing to go all the way with them on fonts for whatever reason, uh, you know, really has, uh, just made everything else in the promotion kind of fall into place and feel, you know, much more solid. Uh, so we'll start the main event, which was the All Japan World Tag Team title match. Uh, Kento Miyahara and Yuma Aoyagi beating Zeus and Shigehiro Irie. Uh, Yuma it gets the referee stoppage on Zeus in 2130 with the end game. Uh, that is their second defense of the World Tag Team titles. This was awesome. I mean, the only, I guess, complaint I, I would have, the big complaint, would be I thought the initial heat segment on Aoyagi was pretty pretty goddamn dull. But, like, once Mihar first tags in, which I don't think takes that long, the match really picks up quite a bit from there. And Irie does this enormous beast bomber uh, at one point that just, like, was one of my highlights of the match, at least in the, uh, I don't know exactly what it was, but it was one of the highlights of the match before the, the you know, the uh, finishing stretch, at least. And... You know, Aoyagi, you know, he got the end game on Zeus pretty early on, I guess. But Zeus and Irie, you know, got out of it. and like, Or Irie helped him get out of it. They were double teaming Aoyagi. Zeus got his, uh, you know, fucking chin lock of death on Aoyagi. But Kento makes the save with this big blackout knee out of nowhere to Zeus from behind. And then Irie comes out of nowhere and, like, takes out Kento with this insane crossbody while Kento is sitting on the apron. She sends both of them absolutely flying. And that leaves Zeus with Aoyagi, but Aoyagi hits this, like, DDT out of nowhere, gets the end game back on, Zeus escapes for the suplex, and then Irie comes flying in off camera with a huge splash on Aoyagi as soon as he lands from the suplex, which is a great spot. And then Zeus hits this huge short-arm lariat for a two-count, goes for the jackhammer, Aoyagi drops down behind him, hits a big German, followed by a kneeling super kick. Zeus, though, basically no-sells it, goes for a choke slam, but Aoyagi fights off, fights him out with his signature kick. I can never remember the name of his kick, I don't know. Uh, whatever it's called, he gets the pin, almost gets the pin off of it. And Irie then hits uh, a huge cannonball on Yuma in the corner, and they double-team him with this, like... It was a really strange... Just I, I don't lo- know if I loved how it, uh, you know, landed, but it was certainly unique. It was like a choke slam electric chair drop combo, and... It's kind of a move where, like, I don't really know if the hand around the throat and the, the quote choke slam actually added anything to the move. So, you know, I don't know if it was, like, the greatest move or any, or, of all time or anything, but at least they're trying something new, you know, whatever. Uh, and then Zeus hits the biceps explosion lariat, which is all-time great name. Uh, Aoyagi kicks out at uh, 2.9999 just before the 20-minute call. And then Zeus hits a huge second lariat, but and I thought he was Aoyagi was done at this point. But he fucking kicks out at two again somehow. And then Aoyagi suddenly rolls through on Zeus, gets the end game locked in again, and again, shocked me watching this live. That was the finish. Zeus passes out. We get the referee stoppage. Huge win for Aoyagi. Uh, and just like the finishing sequence being so awesome, you know, put this one over the top for me to go four and a quarter uh, and capped off what, like I said, what I thought was a pretty great show by the end of it. Yeah, I'll say I love this match so much. I'm loving this current run for Yuma. Pretty much ever since last year's World Tag or Real World Tag League, like the, him them pairing him back up with Kento, like you'd think that would be a bad thing for him, but I think it's really been elevating him because he's pretty much been the star of this team in my opinion. Like Kento's a really good hot tag for all these matches, but 
I think they've kind of put Yuma front and center in m majority of these tag matches. And even his um, title match against uh, Suwama earlier this year. Like, another thing that's looking up for All Japan, I think, is that they're kind of going with Yuma a little bit too. Not kind of more, like, not as front and center as uh, Jake Lee, obviously, but I think uh, he's kind of starting to elevate himself a little bit. I think I could look, definitely see him being like a, if Jake if, actually does beat Suwama for the title, I could definitely see Kent or uh, Yuma being like a, a defense later on in the reign, maybe as a heater, because for the inevitable Kento Jake match, because obviously they got to run that if they ever put the title on Jake. But yeah, same thing as we were saying about Purple Haze before we even talked about the match. I, they're so much better as a team when they're doing just shit like this. Like, Irie is, like you mentioned, his him like doing that crossbody on the apron to Kento. I like I like yelled out when that happened. I was that was amazing. Like Irie was really, I don't, I don't know what to say about it, but uh, yeah, so I, this match just definitely, but definitely better than I expected it to be. And I still thought it was going to end up being the, great anyway. The thing about Yuma, like you said, he's totally the star of this team, just like you said he was. And you know they've really done a good job bringing him along again as a baby face. Um, you know, and, you know, I saw a lot of people be very skeptical when they are skeptical when they put the, these two back together. And I get it because, you know, he had turned on the guy and all that, but it really does, you know, he, he's gotten off to a great start this year. Uh, and I, you know, I don't know if he's going to win the triple ground title or anything anytime soon, but you know, the crowd seems like they're, they're getting really behind him here. Um, but yeah, so that's uh that was a great main event. Uh, the semi main event did not like nearly as much, uh, Yoshitatsu and Osamu Nishimura beat Suwama and Akaru Sato. Uh, Yoshitatsu pinning uh, Sato in 1418. Um, so Gerard, who's been on the show before, he's like the All Japan Voice of Wrestling reviewer, loved this match, and I don't really know what he was watching, honestly. I mean, I just shout out to Gerard; he's a great dude. But I don't like when I saw him say he thought this match was awesome. I was like, I, I, I thought this was fine. I guess. I mean, I thought Nishimura, you know, getting worked over for a while was. Uh, you know, perfectly fine, but also pretty dull. And, like, Yoshitatsu just got his ass beat by both Suwama and Sato in a way that made him look like just the biggest dork. Um, and he's, you know, obviously challenging for the title next week, which, I mean, you could say, well, there's no way to make him look like a good challenger anyway. But, like, yeah, I mean, you know, he... he obviously, I think everybody knows he's going to lose to Suwama in Kyoto next, sat, next Sunday, uh, March 21st. But, you know, this match did not do him any favors in my book. Um... You know, he, he can't, got his little comeback on both guys. Pinned Sato, but I still didn't think he looked like any kind of hot challenge or anything. So I went two and a half stars. I thought it was pretty boring most of the way. Didn't pick up until right before the ending. So, eh. I will say, yeah, <laughs> this, honestly, this is kind of boring. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I was just wait, kind of waiting for it at the end. But I got to give Yoshitatsu credit for, like, teaming up with, like, the most random guys as part of, like, his Yoshitatsu Kingdom shit because it was, like, last... Korokin and he was uh, teaming up with I think he was teaming up with Nishi, Nishimura still but he had like Balian Aki in it too like he's just choosing some weird, random people to team up with but yeah the sooner we can get this title challenge out of the way and get Champions yeah, Carnival started I, mean, I think better, everybody's really. kind of looking forward to Champion Carnival and you know I think I, people want to see this Jake Lee push happen and win the belt and it's like oh yeah we have to do a Yoshi Tatsu title challenge first it's like okay uh, speaking of I'm at least happy it's someone that's not in yeah. Champions Carnival yeah, challenging before. Cool, I guess. So. Speaking of Jake Lee, it was Jake Lee and Yusuke Kodama beating Shotaro Ashino and Koji Iwamoto in 11:26. Lee getting the pinfall on Iwamoto. Um, so the pre-match video package features Jake Lee backstage right after the Ashino turn, uh, saying that, you know, I assume he meant what happened to, uh, you know, Ashino. Uh, was quote justice and I think he said absolute justice and I was like oh Seigi which is justice and it's like how very evil of him because obviously that's what evil has been saying pretty much since he turned heel is like everything is justice um, but yeah the other Total Eclipse members uh, all came out here with Lee and Kodama and you know this was again they, they debuted these new tights a few like a week or so ago but uh you know, this is my first time seeing them, and Lee's new black and silver Total Eclipse tights are pretty awesome. I mean, those are some cool fucking tights. I don't know if you feel any differently, but... I like this oh. old 
uh, gear, to be honest. Like, if they had just kept the same style and just made it black, I probably would have liked it better. Like, they, they're, they're fine, but I definitely kind of prefer, like, the whole shorts uh, like the slits. Yeah, this, this match, you know, I thought this was good. Actually, you know, he did this uh, big German suplex to Kodama off the apron onto the other Total Eclipse members. That was awesome. And Iwamoto was like, hang him at Lee for a little while. He even got a close near fall off his own German suplex. But then Lee was like, okay, I'm done with this guy. And I like, took over with these running knee attacks. A very like Nakamura-esque uh, running knee to the back of the neck. And he points at the sky. I guess that's where the eclipse is. And that's why he's pointing at the sky now like he's Sabu or something. He gives Iromoto a very delayed brain buster. Like really hangs him up there forever. And then gives him the brain buster. And that's the pen. And he almost forgets to cross his arms first. I guess that's going to be a signature pen. You know, get remember, remembered at the last second. Uh, but yeah, that was kind of funny. But yeah, this was a fun coming out party, I thought, for Lee and Kodama. I like they won clean as a sheet, because I was kind of worried when the other uh, Total Eclipse members came out with them that they would either help to win or something. But, uh, you know, Lee looked dominant here, and, uh, you know, Ashino got his little moments to shine, and, you know, even Yomoto got to look, you know, kind of good against Lee at the end, but then Lee put him away, so without much trouble. Yeah, I went three and a half stars. Definitely a good start here for Total Eclipse. Yeah, like you said, I think it was a good start for Eclipse. I think it was just a good look to see how each guy handled the betrayals. Like, Ashino's, like, viciousness against Kodama was great. Like, he's really great at emoting and conveying just how angry he was at Kodama for betraying him. And I decided to look it up and see, like, when was the last time Kodama and Ashino, like, actually faced off in a ring, not as teammates. And it was, like, back in 2017, right before Enfants formed, when uh, Sego and Ashino were facing off with him a few times before Kodama betrayed them. Or betrayed new era to join Ashino, but yeah, that's a nice thing just to see a definitely a, fr- a fresh uh, matchup for Ashino. But uh, maybe it's kind of just my Enfonts fandom a little bit. But I felt like the two, those two, expressed the betrayal a little bit better than Jake and Iomoto did. But they kind of at the same time they both kind of did it a little differently since Jake felt more like he was just kind of toying with Iomoto and eventually get letting Iomoto get his anger out at him for a little bit and then offering him to. Uh, rejoin because at that Shinkiba show you didn't watch um he did offer Iomoto a chance to rejoin him and join uh Eclipse but Iomoto said basically said no and was I think backstage was saying uh, that he was gonna answer him at the Cork and Hall show which his answer was to take his hand and judo throw him so didn't work out for that didn't get to join uh, them but I guess after that Jake just got was it's like fine if you're not gonna join me and then just like pretty <laughs> yeah. much destroyed him so that was really good but uh, after afterwards and yeah i love that as a new afterwards he like to, to continue the theme of like being very vicious towards iromoto he stuffed the mouth guard like down his tights to the was like i don't know just kind of like taunting him like yeah we took we knocked this out of your mouth buddy uh the only thing i don't like about the act so far is the very long pointing at the sky he's been doing like he did it again after the match and it's like i don't know it looks kind of goofy to me but I would kind of, like, modify that or drop that. I mean, maybe it works for him because he's such a, like, you know, a stoic guy. And that's kind of why I thought the the heel turn would work in general. But, yeah, just a little too much, like, point at the sky to me. Just maybe cut back on that a little bit. Uh, and he had a big stare down with Ashino afterwards. But they, they didn't jump him or anything, which I kind of thought they were going to. But, uh... Yeah, it seems like they're gonna. Tr- he's gonna try and do like the not like the classy heel kind of thing. Like I don't think he's gonna like really be like. I don't think I don't think uh, Total Eclipse is gonna be really cheating a whole lot. I think it's just gonna be they're gonna beat you, and if when they beat you, they're right, which is the whole thing he's going for. Is like if we yeah. get results, it's justice uh, kind of thing. Match number three again, Total Eclipse: Kuma Arashi, Koji Doi, Hokuto Omori, and Tajiri beating Shuji Ishikawa, Takao Omori, Black Munster Ray, and Ryuki Honda. Uh, Doi pinning Honda in 9.30 with a lariat. So they use the theme song in the in match four too. But this obviously watching the show in order. This is my first time hearing the new Total Eclipse theme song. I love their theme song. I mean, it's like this big, like spooky and evil theme song. It sounds like it came out of a fucking Castlevania game or something. It absolutely rules. Uh, I really love this theme song. I don't know if you have a ton of thoughts on it, but I thought that theme song was awesome. Oh, I loved it. But. I couldn't tell, like, I think the song that Jake and Kodama came out with, it was a little bit different. Like, it still started the same way. Maybe that's, like, a little hook for the themes. But I don't know. Maybe I was just hearing things. But it kind of sounded like 
the one that Tajiri and them came out with is like the heat, the unit theme, and then Jake has kind of like a different remix version of it. Maybe I was just hearing things, but it's not a different. Either way, it sounds awesome. Like it sounds like some like Castlevania shit or something. Uh, but yeah, it is, like the Castlevania thing is what I thought of immediately. It was like, wow, that's this kind of cool. And I, they had a logo like immediately, so you could tell that this was in the works for a while. Uh, you know, they they first started teasing the Ashino stuff like what in January, right? So they must have known this was the plan all along. But uh, but yeah, Ishikawa and Doi. They had a pretty fun little, like, big dude exchange, I thought, that ended with uh, Shuji hitting the giant knee on him, which left both guys down. And then Total Eclipse, like, were picking on Honda, and they gave him this cool, uh, all four members lift up the guy from the arms and legs on each side of him and drop him spot. And then Doi gave him this a hard lariat against the ropes, a spine buster, a big spine buster, and then finally another lariat for the pin. Uh, great start, I thought, for the new heel unit. They look great here. Match with a ton of fun. I went three and a quarter. You know, just a, not quite long enough to go higher, but definitely, a, a, you know, a fun match here. Yes, I really like the match too. And uh, I like that, like, former Enfants, now Eclipse kind of feel like bigger threats. They don't feel like the more cartoonish heels that they Enfants were post June last year. Maybe the end, they feel a little more re- reinvigorated, it seemed like, in the match. Maybe it's just that yeah. they know the company's behind them now. But I did love the uh, Doi and Shuji stuff, like solo stuff in the middle of the match. And I really like Doi picking up the win here because it feels like he's like the clear number two guy in Eclipse. So uh, good to see them like building him up a little bit, especially since he's going to be in Champions yeah, Carnival he, this year I mean, for he, the first time. He, he seems like he's going to be uh, an early beneficiary. And, you know, they continue to do a really good job bringing Hokoto Amori along. I mean, he's a guy that like, you know, I, he, it, it felt weird to me the first time, obviously, he turned and joined up with all these Wrestle 1 guys. But now, like, you know, the, the unit's even more, you know, has Tajiri and Jake Lee in it, too, now. And he fits in it more, you know, better than ever. And he's just, I don't know, this kid's just a natural heel. So, you know, and he was like the, he was the guy who, oh, sure. like, I talked about this, I think, when we reviewed that show. Like, he was the guy who, um, you know, basically initiated the whole turn. I mean, he, like, low-blowed... Uh, he low blowed uh, Ashino, I think. So you know, I don't think that was by accident. I think they really have a lot of plans for him, probably. So. Yeah, I think before the big turn, him and uh, Hokuto and Ashino were kind of like fighting a little bit, and then even like Ashino and Kuma. But like with the actual turn, it was like basically Doi and Kuma let Ashino get pinned, and then Hokuto did the low blow. Mm-hmm. So. It's kind of a group effort, but Hokuto yeah. is definitely like the one that, who really If people hadn't seen the angle, by the way, they, they played a video clip of it, uh, I think, before match four. It was a great angle. Like, the way Jake Lee just stands there and, like, looks at them and just doesn't make any move. And, like, you you could tell... I Like, when I was watching that show live, I'm like, oh, shit, he's in on this. But they didn't make it super obvious. He was just standing there, like, with a very, like, emotionless expression. And then he just suddenly just starts joining in and starts stomping on him. And then Iwamoto gets mad. He's like, what the fuck is your problem? And, you know, Jake doesn't just, like, go after him right away. Like, you know, Iwamoto keeps pushing him and pushing him. And finally Jake is like, you know what, fuck this guy. And it just, like, elbows him right in the face. Just a great turn. Uh, and then, you know, he even has a little bit of comedy at the end where Tajiri's like, you know, looks around. He's like, I'm sorry. I want to stay with Jake Lee. And gives, like, a little, like, prayer hands to Iwamoto and runs off with uh, with Jake and the, the Enfants guys. So... Just a great turn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Tajiri's reaction to that was great. <laughs> and I know I know a lot of people I know the people complain about Tajiri being involved in this because of course the Booker guy Booker guy has to book himself with like the hottest angle in the fat or in the promotion. But if we're tying this back into Infants, at least especially the or they pretty much always had like a older guy with them. In Wars One it was a uh, uh Kenny Jiro or I. Well, drunk Andy then Kenny Jiro or I, but the same guy. But so I kinda like that kind of them keeping that on in all Japan with Tajiri now, even if like I, I understand people's gripes with him, but yeah, I, I kind of like, like him in Eclipse. He's a cool, honest. he's a cool little hand to have. I don't know, he's not. I doubt he's going to be like a big focus of the unit or anything. But uh, match number two was a three way match. Alejandro gets the win here in seven o two with the SOS Toto. Uh, he got the pin. That was the DET thing on Akira, basically. Um, yeah, so I hate three-way matches. This is the kind of shit I definitely resent the Shuji-Tajiri booking team for bringing into All Japan. 
Uh, but with that said, this is perfectly fine. You know, two and three quarters. It was all right. Yeah, I thought it was a pretty fun enough three-way. Like like I said, three-ways aren't always my cup of tea, but I thought this was pretty fun. And I did really like uh, Alejandro picking up the win here. I thought he had a pretty good performance in it. And I think him picking up the win here is good news for and people like me that want to see more of Alejandro in All Japan because I'm not sure why they'd really feel the need to give him a win if they don't want to at least do something with him. So I'm curious what that'll be if they ever actually bring him in more frequently. I mean, he's on a lot of the shows anyway, but I'd like to see him get some like a little more focus, I guess. I don't know, but you never, I don't know what they're doing with the junior division yeah. in All Japan now that Shima has developed. Uh, the opener was Izanagi and Utamaro beating Dan Tamura and Ryuji Hijikata. Izanagi pinning Tamura in 751. Uh, I was really enjoying this for a bit. Like It was a surprisingly fun, energetic opener. But it ended with a major botch, so you got to take up points for that with Tamura like botching the double bridge. Uh, you know, they went for it again and then almost got it, but then Tamura slipped at the end when he was supposed to schoolboy Izanagi. So I don't know. It was I went two and three quarters instead of three stars, basically. I, I, I enjoyed it, though. I mean, you know, it was a fine little opener besides the fact that they fucked up at the end. Yeah, I think it was a fine opener, and really the main takeaway was that they fucked up the ending, went for it again, and then kind of saved it, but not uh, really. That, so yeah, overall, I thought this was a great show. Uh, you know, awesome main event. Uh, nothing that'll, like, fucking, you know, fill up your notebook on the undercard, but everything was fun. And all the Total Eclipse stuff is, like, you know, they just feel like such a fresh unit that, you know, that really, like, carried the undercard for me. I mean, these All Japan undercards never blow you away, really. But, like... You know, with with the total eclipse stuff, I think it felt like this was a uh, this undercard had more you know more stuff to it. You know, more like stuff to sink your teeth into, even though the matches weren't like blow away or anything like that. So, but anything to add about all Japan before we move on? Uh, not a lot. It definitely. Uh, I think if you gave up on all Japan last year, I, I think. For now, I'm cautiously yeah. optimistic. That's a good time to jump jump in, but I, I'm not. I, I'm just half expecting them to just say lol and have Kento win the Champions Carnival again and beat Suwama because it's an Oda Award. Or that, assuming that's where the title match is going to end up being, since they're doing mm-hmm. that for the first time in like eight years, I think in May. So, uh, it would be very All Japan booking just to have Kento win Champions Carnival and beat Suwama in Oda Award since he's the Golden Boy. But I'm hoping it's Jake. <laughs> but Either way, even if that isn't Jake, I think this total eclipse units definitely uh, lit a fire under all Japan a little bit. And like I said, I think it's make, at least making the undercard a uh, little so bit coming more up exciting. In all Japan. So first of all, Thursday, March eighteenth, the first one match show in all Japan pro wrestling history. Uh, Shinkiba, uh, Shinkiba first ring already sold out for this one match show. Uh, this is Shuji Shikawa challenging Jun Kazai for the Gaora TV title in a glass board. And barbed wire board and TLC deathmatch. So there you go. Jun Kazai's second defense here. Uh, I would definitely be tuning in for that one. Yeah, see, I can't wait for that. I like the little preview tag they had. The last Corkin was like uh, with Kasai and Tomio Harada versus, I think it was Honda and Shuji. That was really fun. So I'm really excited for this uh, deathmatch because. It's When's been, the last time Shuji's even been in a death time, match? It's definitely been he, a while. He was Big Japan Deathmatch champion, I think, 2012? Let's look this up. I think it's 2012 or something like that. And, you know, he retired from the Deathmatch division after that, so I don't know if he's done a single one since that. He may have done, like, one or two here or there. Let's see. When did he hold the Big Match title? Okay, it was close. Uh, 2013. So he held the Deathmatch title January 2nd, 2013 through November 4th, 2013. So that was his big deathmatch run. That's where most of the scars you see on his body come from. That one year uh, in the deathmatch division. But yeah, uh, he is. He has not done deathmatches in a long time. So that'll be interesting. Uh, the next big show is well, big show in in, in quotation marks. Uh, next Sunday from the Kyoto KBS Hall, uh, the again Dream Power Series, March twenty first. Uh, your main event, obviously, Suwama making his seventh defense of the Triple Crown title against Yoshitatsu. Uh, that will be what it will be, I guess. Uh, and Shima defending the junior title against Izanagi. Uh, you know, that could be pretty good, I guess. I mean, I can't say I'm, like, 
counting down the days for an Izanagi title defense or anything, but uh, or title challenge, I should say. And I doubt he's going to win, but, uh, you know, we'll have to wait and see, I guess. It's really hard to find. I was trying to, like, look up and see if when he's gotten a title shot or anything. He might have gotten one as Atsushi Maruyama before, but let's see. See if we can see if Izanagi got any title shots in All Japan before for the World Jute. I was trying to think if he challenged yeah, Yuamoto in that last frame, but I don't think he did. Uh, so he challenged Susumu Yokosuka. That's right. March 23rd, 2020. That match only went eight and a half minutes. And I think that's his only title challenge in history. No, he challenged Atsushi Aoki when he was uh, Atsushi Maruyama at the time in 2018. And he challenged Tajiri in 2017. So he's had a bunch of title challenges. So this will this will be his fourth title challenge, and he's never obviously never won the belt. So I don't think the fourth time will be the will be the uh, charm for him. But who knows? Uh, I'm just curious what the uh, involvement with like Shima and uh, Stronghearts are yeah, going to be now that they've signed with Great. Uh, the rest of the nowhere, card but... of singles match with Francesco Akira and Yusuke Kodama. Uh, we have, let's see, Shuji Shikawa, Takao Omori, and Blackman Saray, uh, against uh, the team of Shitaro Ashino, Dan Tamura, and is that Hikaru Sato? I don't know who that is. Mitsuru Sato? Is it just a, okay, it's probably just a mis- it's probably Sato. A mistranslation. Uh, and then the, there's an A-man tag with Kento, uh, both the Aoyagi brothers and Rising Hayato, Against Total Eclipse, Jake Lee, Tajiri, Hokoto Omori, and Kuma Arashi. So, yes, uh, there you go. That's the. Uh, I could just check, search the kanji. Let's see if, who that is. Uh, yeah, it is a card. I don't know why they mistranslated his name in the uh, auto translator. But yeah, so that's your March 21st KBS Hall show. Uh, you know, nothing like, like looks incredible or anything, but we are going to cover it next week because I'm into the All Japan right now. But uh, that's like their last big show before, um, you know, before the Champion Carnival. There's another show at Saitama and, uh, on March 28th. Really nothing of note on that show. Um, and then the Champion Carnival gets kicked off in April. I believe April. Let's see the date. Uh, on April 11th. Oh, that's 2020. <laughs> clicked. Why do they they have these calendar goes all the way back? April 9th. So Friday, April 9th is when the Champion Carnival kicks out off, and uh, we will have daily audio coverage of that on the Wrestling Omakase Patreon uh, throughout the month of April. So you know, definitely a tournament I'm excited to cover. Hopefully, it's a lot better than last year's Champion Carnival, which fucking sucked. <laughs> I mean, I, I'd be pretty surprised if it wasn't, but we'll have to wait and say. Uh. I feel yeah. like the single I mean, block a lot of tournament's going to help it a lot, so. too. So let's go over now to DDT, our last topic for this week. Uh, this is the DDT March 14th Corican, the Daydream Believer 2021. Some big pre-show announcements, first of all. Really only two, actually. But uh, So the inaugural Ultimate Tag League 2021 uh, opens on May 9th on Corican, and the finals are May 27th at Shinjuku Face. I can't say I was dying for another uh, round robin league in Japanese wrestling, but uh, you know, I'm willing to see what this is like. This one we will not be covering uh, in daily coverage on the Omakase Patreon because I do enough of those already, and they always make me want to die. So uh, we'll, we'll stick with King of DT and Do for the Omakase Patreon schedule. But yes, yeah, so another another tag league. Are you excited, TJ? It'll be fun to watch. Probably won't watch it every time it, like as soon as it airs or anything like that but i'm always down for some tournaments and i'm curious yeah. what teams are going to be in it to be honest because i mean there are a couple like standby teams but they, i'm sure they'll throw together some random stuff especially with like all out just breaking up so there could and be some new, we have a new trainee, potential teams uh, yuya Kor- koroko will debut on april 11th at corican hall 23 years old from chiba uh his background is in baseball karate and amateur wrestling and he's trained at the animal hamaguchi gym uh, so that's exciting. Also, want to give a plug, by the way, for all these translations to the, uh, as we always do, the DDT English Update account. Although I think it's now DDT Tokyo Joshi English Update account. Uh, but yeah, it's DDT Pro underscore ENG. So shout out to Mr. Haku and the uh, the account over there. 
but yeah, so that's uh, a new trainee. That's pretty cool. I have to wait and see. Uh, you know, he look, he debuts next month at Corican. So uh, the a fun thing to open the show. So ten years ago, right after the Great Tohoku Earthquake, you know, Japan was like trying to conserve energy nationally, and you know, DDT. They did their first show post disaster, and like. You know, they cut out the Tron and did the whole opening video live with, like, you know, these wrestlers, like, piling into the ring to, um, you know, like, act, basically do a live rendition of, like, uh, a pre -show, of the pre-show graphics. And, you know, obviously that, that, that earthquake was a terrible tragedy, and Japan has been doing a lot of stuff to try to, you know, um, you know, commemorate the, the tragedy, you know, never forget kind of thing. And it's one of these things where I'm sure it must feel weird for people to uh, commemorate that kind of tragedy when we're in the middle of a, an ongoing, you know, uh, crisis. But, like, uh, I'm, it's cool they did this. And the, the DET wrestlers had a great time with it coming in the ring and, like, all getting each other's faces and while they're being announced. So that was pretty cool and a really cool thing to do, uh, you know, to uh, uh, commemorate, what, like I said, what was a terrible tragedy. So... Uh, the let's start at the main event here and work our way down. Uh, and what a main event we're starting with here. The DDT Universal title. Yuki Ueno defeats Yusuke Okada uh, with the WR in 2001, his fourth defense. This match was fucking awesome. Um, like, I I feel like a broken record on this show at this point, but Yuki Ueno is the most underrated wrestler in the entire world. I mean, he goes out here and has nothing... But outstanding, outstanding matches for this Universal title every time he gets in the ring. He was great before this title reign when he was in uh, Natalia's 2 with, uh, you know, God, why am I blanking on his name? The big dude. Thank you. Naomi Yoshimura. Uh, currently Naomi Yoshimura. Uh, I was thinking like big and orange. Those are two things that were go coming away, but a name was not coming. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, when he was in the Natalia's team with Naomi Yoshimura, uh, you know, they... You know, they had outstanding matches as a tag team. And ever since that team had to break up, unfortunately, because of Yoshimura, you know, needing time off to heal his neck. I mean, Ueno has been incredible here in this Universal title. Right? I mean, this guy, you know, if more people watch DDT, people will be talking about this guy as, like, one of the great young wrestlers in all of wrestling. I mean, he's up there. I mean, he's, like, one of the best anywhere, not just in DDT. And, you know, this guy is only 25 years old. And he's already this good. Uh, he just turned 25 in September. He's not even, like, about to turn 26. And, yeah, I mean, Okada's great. I think a lot of people know that already. Because, you know, Yusuke Okada was in All Japan. And, you know, people were kind of like, are they ever going to push this guy? Like, what are they doing? And, you know, it turned out that, uh, of course, he was leaving the company at the end of the year. Uh, and that's why they, they had, like, so heavily de-pushed him last year. But, yeah, these two guys, they just, you know, two young dudes here who really just went out there and... You know they put on a they put on a show here. I mean, you know they they just let it all hang out. They just threw themselves all over this ring with reckless abandon. Every cliche you can come up with, they did it all. Uh, you know there was like this one late match exchange where like Ueno was going for some kind of or a late match example I should say. Ueno was going for some kind of like standing senton into the corner with Okada just standing there, and Okada moves and Ueno. Like, he doesn't slow himself down. He doesn't, like, prepare himself to take this bump. He just absolutely nails this turnbuckle pad crotch first at top fucking speed. It looks so brutal. And it led immediately where the two, with the two of them being out on the apron where Okada gave him this big German suplex, uh, you know, out there. And, yeah, I mean, that's that whole little sequence was, like, just a great example of how they, they just went out there and they were just going a mile a minute and just, like, you know doing everything they could here to have an amazing match. And Okada, you know, got, got this whole string of big moves after that for near falls. He did this big fisherman's brain buster hold uh, that Ueno just barely kicked out of, which got like a big shock reaction from the crowd. They cl they clearly thought that was it. Uh, and Ueno comes back with this absolutely batshit Rana from inside the ring to Okada standing on the apron that Okada takes this insane bump for. The noise as he hits the mat... Um, was just, like, incredible. Just, like, I don't know, just smacked the fucking mat on the outside. Um, and that ends up being the turning point. Ueno hits a few more moves back in the ring and finally gets the pen. 
Uh, this was fucking awesome. I mean, really spectacular. I went four and a half stars. I think this was better than Zack and Osprey, which people are, you know, praising more heavily uh, from the same weekend. I was already thinking four and a quarter, at least, until that fucking insane Rana spot right at the end. And I think that basically was like where, okay, I'm giving this match four and a half stars. I mean, just a crazy last spot that really took this one over the top for me. And I think it just barely edges out Endo Akiyama, which I also gave four and a half, uh, you know, for my DDT match of the year so far. And Ueno, you know, he is, you know, uh, uh, Jamie, who of course runs the uh, Dramatic DDT blog, he said it, you know, before... Uh, in, in, in the Voice of Wrestling Discord that Ueno is the, D, the DT MVP at the moment. I just, I don't even think it's close. I mean, he is an incredible, incredible wrestler. And this was an incredible match. If you, if you don't normally watch DDT, if you didn't see this match, uh, make sure you go out of here to see it. This was so awesome. Yeah, I'll say it was an incredible main event and I'll one-up you and just say you need to watch like all of uh, Ueno's title matches for with his belt because like I was not in love with this belt from like the big, like when it started because it was basically all Chris and Sasaki with their endless feud, and then finally Ueno wins his belt, and it's just great match after great match, and I think this is like the best match of his reign so far, and like I said, probably the DT match of the year for me right now. The only other match I can think of that I'd really compare it is the um, Eruption versus Sonic Club from uh, Kawasaki Strong. I think it was Ka- no, it wasn't Kawasaki Strong. It was um, it was sometime last month. I can't remember what show it was on. But that those two are probably like the front runners for like my DC match of the year, and yeah, I don't know, man, it's incredible. Anyways, Wayne is on this just amazing run. He's pretty much going to be the man I think about with this belt for the future until someone else eventually one ups him if they are able to. And I don't know what they're do like why they're dragging their heels with signing Okada, but they need to get him under contract immediately because I got maybe it's financial reasons I don't really know, but the dude doesn't work anywhere else except for DDT, so I don't know why they won't just put the pen to paper for him because he's been on an yeah, incredible run awesome. in DT since he showed up. And yeah, so this is definitely like one of the best matches I've seen in the past couple weeks, at least. Off, off the top of my head, the only one I can think of in comparison would be the um, Kaito Ishida and Shun Skywalker yeah. uh, Dream hey, Gate match from one Dragon one Gate at the same level last week, Okada and Shingo in the New Japan Cup, which was also almost as good. But I don't know. It might have been better. These two, those two, are really, really close. I mean, they're both four and a half star matches. But yeah, uh, you know, this has been a just a really hell of a run here for uh, for Yuki Ueno, and you know, he's a guy that like if you don't watch the ET, you got to pay more attention because he is so fucking good. Uh, the semi main event was for the KOD six man tag team titles. Uh, the team of Tetsuya Endo, Soma Takao, and Yuji Hino defeat the Young Communication Generation. Uh, Akito, Kazuki Hirata, and Shota. Uh, Soma pins Shota with the running elbow butt in 1307. So that makes Damnation the 43rd six man tag team champions. Uh, they failed in V3 here. Uh, the other team, I should say. But yeah, this was good. I mean, it wasn't like the, the two matches on either side of it, I think, were uh, more spectacular, even though I, I don't know if I love the extreme title matches we'll get into in a second. But, uh, you know this match. The big thing in the the pre match, uh, Kazuki Hirata comes out we- wearing his six man and eight man tag title belts like both around his waist, one on top of each other, like a true Chad. That was so awesome. Uh, but yeah, there was like this. Uh, there was this like, pretty funny spot where like you know Hirata he thinks he has Yuji Hino on the ropes after a lot of help from both his teammates, and he tries to hit the title match bomber on him, but Hino tags out to Endo who, like, leaps into the ring off the top rope and just, like, lands on his feet, on his feet in front of him, like, you know, hello. Uh, and it's just kind of, like, it was kind of funny, like, just Endo landing, right? Because they have a lot of history, too. It's like, uh, you know, Endo doesn't like him. But, yeah, Hirata did finally get the title match bomber out of nowhere. Uh, and Endo takes this fucking awesome flip bump for it that's, like, almost a thing of art. I rewound that bump, like, five times. It was just an incredible... Uh, flip bump by, by Tetsuya Endo. And Soma ends up getting the pin pretty much out of nowhere on Shota with his big running elbow. Definitely wasn't expecting that. And uh, I thought this was fun. I went three and a half stars. Good match. Yeah, that was a pretty good match. I really? Was I was surprised I, Damnation I think, won. I think to be honest, like, I kind of expected like, Akito and them. But I don't know. I don't know. I, I was kind of expecting them to at least have a little bit of a longer run. But I mean, it's six-man yeah. titles they can pretty much change whenever 
because I was I've really been enjoying this uh, Akito Harada Shota team. But yeah, the really the like the theme of the match felt like it was like them trying to figure out how to deal with Hino because that's kind of been honestly it's been the kind of the theme of like all of Hino's matches since he joined DDT is it's like these guys trying to figure out what they can even do to this guy to beat him. And I loved like like you mentioned with Harada or with Harada thinking he had uh, Hino on the ropes <laughs> and then fucking it up because he took too long and. And uh, or he you know was able to tag out. I love that. But yeah, it was a pretty good match. Uh, I kind of like I said, I'm just I'm really just surprised Damn Nation won. And but we'll see. I'm curious who's gonna beat them now because yeah, exactly. I don't know who they're gonna have that can handle. Uh, you know. Match four is for the DT Extreme Title: a barbed wire casket death match. Chris Brooks defeats Shuma Katsumata by casket burial in fourteen ten. So Shuma fails in a second defense, and Brooks becomes. The 51st Extreme Champion. Um, of course, this was Joker Shunma. And the casket seemed to have Lego pieces glued to the side of it, which was pretty funny. Um, but yeah, I mean, this match you know, had, had lots of crazy spots. I mean, Shuma, you know, set Brooks up. with on, Like, he tried to set him up for some kind of, like, uh, crazy, crazy, like, chair contraption. And, like, tried to suplex him off the top rope onto it. But, like, you know, Brooks, like, ends up stopping him. Or he tried to, like, do a splash off the top you know, through the contraption. But Brooks got up and stopped him and hit this, like, big, like, swinging suplex off the apron under a chair pile. That looked pretty nasty. Uh, Shuma did a, uh, like, a Death Valley driver on Brooks off the apron through a barbed wire board set up between two cha- two tables. That looked nasty for both of them. Um, and you, know, you could see you could see where Brooks' back was all bloody from the barbed wire. Um, you know, there was... They were like actual tacks instead of Legos and the the normal like in the Lego set, which was a uh, you know again nasty stuff they did in all the tacks and stuff. But like when you know Brooks goes to stuff Shuma in the casket, and suddenly two Joker Druids showed up, clearly Takashita and Mao. That was you know I, I get it. This is supposed to be goofy anyway, but like they're doing all this like thumbtacks and like barbed wire shit, and then all of a sudden we have Joker Druids. It seems just kind of I don't know like it, it's DDT, so I shouldn't be surprised, but like. The, the the shift in tone didn't really work for me there, and you know they distracted Brooks so Shuma could low blow him, uh, and then like we have like I said Joker Druids, but then he puts tax in his mouth and super kicks him. It's like okay, like uh, it just seemed a little like tonally off there or something, and then Shuma like he invited the Joker Druids in the ring, and then he essentially just used them to balance himself and hit this weird swinging DET off the second rope. It didn't even look like he needed the Druids to balance himself. It looked like he could have just climbed up the second rope by himself. But the actual DET, I think it was supposed to look cool and it did. They just kind of landed pretty awkwardly right next to the ladder. Um, and Shuma, you know, the finish was, like, really goofy. Where, like, you know, uh, he, he, like, he basically, like, tried to set up, you know, Brooks for some kind of flying splash with Brooks' head on the lid of the casket. Brooks moves out of the way, pulls the lid with him, so Shuma just fucking falls right in the casket, and Brooks slams the lid on for the win. And it's like, after all that, that was the fucking finish? Like, you go through barbed wire and all this shit, and the, the finish was like, whoopsie daisy! <laughs> Are you laying in the casket? Okay. It was like, I don't know. It was like, it was a cute finish, but like, too cute by half. Uh, but this still had a lot of sick bumps, fun garbage spots. Uh, you know, I can, I don't know. I went three and a half stars. Really didn't know how to rate this. It was goofy, it was fun, had a lot of crazy bumps, had a lot of weird shit and stupid shit, so I just slapped three and a half on it and moved on with my day. Yeah, so I, I really like this match, but I was coming in here for like really stupid spots and they got, they delivered in that. And like you, I didn't love the whole Joker Druid thing, mostly just because it didn't feel like they even did anything. Like I didn't even see them, I didn't even see Shuma like do the low blow. So I didn't know that's why they were just distracting him or distracting him for, and then whatever that DT spot with them, like basically like assisting them. I don't know. I think it would have been better if they just had Takashita and Mao come out. Like they were already the ones carrying out the casket before the match. I think he would have got the same thing across of them being in the Joker make. That was the whole reason they were doing it, just to show <laughs> Takashita and Mao and Joker paint. So they could have just done that with them carrying the coffin. But I don't know. I enjoyed it a lot. It was, I definitely prefer Chris in like this style of like goofy match and doing stupid spots can, rather than him trying to do like big epic matches. So hopefully I'm not exactly thrilled with him winning the title, 
well, one, because I thought I would like to see Shima have a longer reign, but also because I don't really love Chris singles matches that much. But at least with the extreme title, it's usually it's going to be gimmick matches, so I'll probably enjoy it. I'll, I'll probably enjoy them more than his uh, universal title run because really the only thing on that run I really enjoyed that much was his like deck hardcore After match with new uh, Drew Parker. Champion, nailed the casket shut, I guess hoping to suffocate Joker Schumann to death. And four more druids, this time not Joker druids, just generic druids, uh, carried the casket to the back. So there you go. I guess Joker Schumann's dead? I don't know. Uh, after the match, we find out who Takagi's partners will be for the March 28th Korokin eight-man tag title match. And Takagi put together a team of fail sons. <laughs> he put together a team of guys who have, like, not lived up to their... I, actually, I don't know anything about the fucking... I don't know about Nabe Yakan. His father is, like, a beloved comedian from the Showa era, according to uh, the dramatic DET blog. I don't know. I think he's from, like, what? B- fucking Best Body Pro Wrestling or something? Right? Yeah, and... Yeah, it's like Best Body Japan. Like I didn't, I didn't know what his name was or like what his deal with the company yeah, is, but I re- definitely recognize the shirt. I think he's like some kind of power lifter and bit. also uh, an actor, according to what I was able to Google. But like he's very short, which I guess is, the, is kind of funny. But then obviously you have Yuki Onaya, who's very very tall, so he looks funny next to Nabe Yakan. But uh, he's his, you know, he comes from a family of famous sumo wrestlers, and so far he's done absolutely nothing as a pro wrestler. And Chikara. Who's uh, obviously, you know, the fail son of Mitsuo Momoda and the grandson of Ricky Dozen. So, yeah, it's uh, Takagi and the fail sons, which I think was like quite the team here uh, in that eight man tag title match. But they're calling themselves actually Team Thoroughbred. But there you go. The T- Takagi's sworn to protect <laughs> and nurture these people. That's great. So, that's, uh, that's something. Uh, match number three Jun Akiyama and Makoto Oishi versus Kashisada Higuchi and Yukio Sakaguchi ends in a double countout in 744, obviously building up the Akiyama Higuchi KOD title match for, for in a couple weeks. Um, you know, this was pretty good. You know, Higuchi, like, tried to go after Akiyama with the claw again and got his big leg sweep into the pin attempt, and you know, which he, he pinned him in the uh, DO in like two minutes or something last time with that. But uh, this time Oishi was there to save. And then everyone fought on the floor, and we get the always disappointing double count out finish. But I thought there was good action up until then. Uh, I'm surprised they thought Makoto Oishi, of all people, couldn't take a pinfall here. But whatever. Three stars I went. It was pretty good. It was fine. Didn't go very long and ended very abruptly. So, Yes, I, I, I enjoy this a lot. I do agree. I, I mean, obviously, it's always not... It's never good to have a double count out. And I wish this match had gone on a little bit longer but i mean what we did get to see i liked like i liked how they got to the double count out like that whole finishing sequence but yeah i wish i could have just had a just had a way she eat the fall but and also i did love uh i, I don't know what the i don't know moving inside well but i know like Oishi was had a higuchi in this uh submission hold and i love that higuchi just like used the claw to escape it so that was like probably like one of the big highlights in the actual match of it but really i just i don't know I'm very excited for this Higuchi and uh, Akiyama match, and I think this kind of just helped me get a little more hyped for it. But as far as like a match itself, it wasn't anything special, but two. I enjoyed it. Hiroshima and Toru Washi beat Daisuke Sasaki and Mad Polly, Konosuke Takashita and Mao, and Yuki Ino and Yuki Onaya in a four way tag match. Hiroshima pins Ino with the Somato at 844. This is pretty fun. Uh, you know, uh, Sasaki and Polly for some reason jumped Takashita during his entrance. Uh, and Hiroshima and Owashi hadn't even come out yet. They, like, peered through the curtain when the music hit and then hurried out. That was pretty funny. Yuki Onaya, he's lost a lot of weight. Like, he almost looks like a totally different person between the, the weight loss and the different hair, which I thought was interesting. Uh, and yeah, Hiroshima pins Ino with the Somato after taking out Naya by essentially ramming Ino's shoulder first into his own partner. Uh, fun little match here, all action. Nothing you gotta go anywhere to see or anything, but I went three and a quarter. I enjoyed it. Yeah, it was a fun little match. I think I really I really enjoyed the team of Sasaki and Polly a lot more than the team of Polly and Soma, which seems to be like the default team they go to for these undercard shows. I think Sasaki and Polly's have a little better chemistry yeah. together, especially just like for comedic spots and stuff. And 
I did love uh, Takashita going to suplex uh, Sasaki, but Sasaki like grabbed the ref, so he almost suplexed both of them. And then afterwards, Takashi just like kind of patted the ref's head to be like, "You're oh, you're okay, it's okay." <laughs> but I kind of didn't like that Eno ended up taking the fall here because I don't, I don't know, I just don't know what they're gonna do with him now that all outs done. He doesn't really have any kind of direction, and he just came back, so there it's not go. ideal, really. Uh, the opener was the six man tag team match uh, with was this? I think this may have been the first ever pin. For Keigo Nakamura, did he did he get a pin before this, or it was just his first championship? I don't know. This is technically his first real pin, and like I think it was, it was like last year. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I saw I saw that match. match. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where they switched that's, bodies. That's pretty great. So that's not like that's technically his first pin, but it's not actually his first pin, but. Yeah, of course, his yes, uh, first actual pin so falls great. over a photo book. Um, but yeah, so it was uh, the DET Iron Man heavy metal, heavy metal white title, six fan tag team match. Uh, the Young Bucks autobiography, Killing the Business, Don Shokudino and Keiko Nakamura, and they came out to the Bucks theme, which is really funny, defeated the Saki Akai photo book, Lip Hip Shake, the current champion, or it got the champion entering this match, I should say. Saki Akai and Antonio Honda with Nakamura pinned Lip Hip Shake with the exquisite and 833 to become the 1500th champion yeah a big milestone champion too and he, and he was champion for like a minute <laughs> but yes uh because right after the match saki pinned him with the rookie award to become the 1501st champion um yes yeah, so the the two books started they didn't do anything because they're fucking books uh and Akego came off the top rope to try to knock one down but they both stayed up uh, so Honda and Dino came in to get the books, and this was under tornado tag rules, uh, so that was fine, I guess. And Saki and Keiko tagged in. Saki was like well in control, because which makes sense, because like Keiko Nakamura looks like he weighs about as much as Saki Akai, except Saki's clearly like he looks just as skinny as her, but she has like six inches on him. Uh, but then Dino came in and hit her from the outside with the Bucks book, or he didn't come in the ring; he just hit her from the outside with the Bucks book to. Uh, let uh, Keigo have a fighting chance here. And then Gota Hashi ran out, armed with a spoon for some reason, to try to get his Saki photo book back, and ends up in a fight with the actual Saki Akai. And Dino takes advantage, gives her the Don Shoku driver, but then knocks himself out on the top rope with the book when aiming for Honda. That made me laugh a lot. The book fell on top of him, almost pinned him. I thought it was going to be the finish. But Keigo made the save. Yes, folks, we had a uh, false finish with a book Almost pinning a man. <laughs> that actually might be funnier to me than having an actual finish with a book pinning a man. Uh, and then Kago gives the magazine a springboard moonsault. He le- leaps from the apron to the second rope. And I guess that's the exquisite. And becomes the new Iron Metal Heavyweight Champion. Or Iron Man Heavy Metal Weight Champion. Uh, and he seems to be like having a moment with the book afterward. So a visibly disgusted Saki boots him in the face. To immediately pin him for the title, which is funny. This was hilarious. I enjoyed every second. Oh, I, I love this match. It's so funny. And I just love that, like I mentioned, this is like Kago's first big win, first title <laughs> win in the company, and it's over a photo book, and then he loses it because he was, guy was so horny. disgusted by his horniness. She's like, I have to do something about this. Yeah, it was something. Uh, the only other match on the show was the dark match, which was uh, Hideki Okatani beating Tori Koji with the Northern Light Suplex in 419. Not a ton to say about it. Very basic young boy match. Uh, not much that made it stand out to me. So two and a half stars or so. Very average match. Yeah, it was a fine little title or fine little dark match. Um, I'm just enjoying watching uh, Kojima kind of develop on this undercard a little bit. I think he's pretty decent so far for a young boy, but I mean. It's a young boy, but it's really to say about him. But I am enjoying Hideki a lot, though. Like, Okatani's been improving so much as part of Akiyama Gun. I can't really show it in here, but I just want to say that I am I think he's been yeah. improving a lot ever since uh, so Akiyama showed That is Daydream Believer. Definitely, you know, if this is a show that, like, you know, didn't stand out to you, you know, you the listener, I mean, uh, because there's no KOD title match on top or anything, and it was like a, you know, there's, it's a weird month with two Korokans, which DD doesn't do all the time. Uh, definitely watch it because especially there's a great show in general, but the main event 
especially was fucking awesome. I do not miss that main event with the Wado and Okada. Uh, but yeah, good good show here. Uh, definitely enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, I'll say it. even if you're not like a DDT person, I definitely at least check out the main event. I think that's a go. match like anyone uh, can really enjoy. So the next show coming up in two weeks, like I said, in under two weeks now, the DDT Judgment 2020 24th anniversary show, also from Corican on March 28th. Uh, the main event is the KOD Open Weight title, Jun Akiyama versus Katsada Higuchi. Uh, very much looking forward to that. We also have the eight man tie title match I just talked about before with Shinya Aoki, Super Sasango Machine, Antonio Honda, and Kazuki Hirata against Shinshiro Takagi and his team of Fail Sons. Uh, a special DDT 24th anniversary single match, uh, Hiroshima versus Yukio Sakaguchi. That could be really fun. Uh, and then we have. The Damnation versus Sauna Club. Um, or I guess are they now the 37 Kamina? That's what their name is now? Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's, it says the, 30, That's the, news to the me. 37 Kamina are now getting going as a full-time unit. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Okay, I don't know. Yeah, I, that's what it says here. Well, I missed that. it too, so uh, <laughs> someone will have to explain that one to me. So Damnation versus the 37 Kamina. Uh, Daisuke Sasaki, Tetsuya Endo, Yuji Hino, and Mad Polly against Kanosuke Takeshita, Yuki Ueno, Shuma Katsumata, and Mao. Uh, match three, Don Shokudino, Makoto Oishi, and Saki Akai against Toru Washi, Akito, and Keigo Nagamura. Uh, Soma Takao facing Hideki Ogatani in a singles match. And Chris Brooks and to- uh, Tori Kojima against Yusuke Okada and Yuki Ino. So some fun stuff on that Korokan. Uh, definitely looking forward to that. So that's coming up on the 28th. We also already know a few matches for the April 11th Korokan, uh, the April Fool show, uh, which is Katsada Higuchi and Yukio Sakaguchi defending the KOD tag titles against Hiroshima and Yuchi Okabayashi from Big Japan. Uh, and Actually, it's the only match we know. We also know Gorgeous Matsuna will have a pre-60th birthday commemorative match. Again, right now his opponent is just listed as X. And we also know Yuya Koroko will have his debut match, but he also has an X as, as his opponent. So uh, that's what we know so far about April Fool. But tag title match looks cool, but I uh, don't know much else. There you go. Uh, all right, TJ, I uh, want to get some plugs in here before we wrap things up. Uh, so you can uh, follow me on Twitter at ASPI underscore uh... Not a whole lot of wrestling tweets. Mostly like anime and games, really. That, like, but, uh, with Nicole, and... I just finished the first season. It's so good. Uh, no, like I've most mm. like most anime I've been watching lately is like the current season of stuff. It's like watching uh, Higurashi, uh, Jujutsu Kaisen. Yeah, I'm way I'm way uh, behind. On current, I'm way behind on current stuff. But Nicole yeah, wanted to watch uh, Princess Tutu, which is like this 2002. Like, it's this weird... It's like Sailor Moon meets ballet, basically. And it's really fucking good. So, uh, if you're look in the market for a 20-year-old anime, a 20-year-old uh, shoujo, definitely check out Princess Tutu. It's a lot of fun. Although, we had to buy the fucking Blu-ray, because they only had the... For some reason, all the streaming services only had the English, which was annoying. But, yeah. it's I, I, I ain't... You know, no That's offense weird. people like dubs, but dubs are not for me. Not a Not a dub person. Yeah, I'm not a dub person. Yes, I uh, But yes, uh, I'm sorry, I interrupted your plug, so go ahead and plug your podcast too. But, um, yeah. <laughs> yes, I uh, also host a podcast, the One Wrestling Podcast. It's uh, me and my wife, Caitlin, just talking about whatever uh, show that week we decide to talk about and talk about news and all that kind of stuff. Uh, this week, we'll be talking about two of the same shows me and John just talked about, so you can get my wife's thoughts on that since you already kind of heard mine, but it's the uh, DC show, DC Corkin and the Old Japan Corkin. But we're also going to talk about the uh, big Noah show from over the weekend, uh, which had uh, Mudo doing his uh, big, uh, V1 <laughs> for his uh, Reign of Terror, as some seem People to think get, it is. And, the uh, fucking the VOW, junior title uh, match and some other Noah stuff. Noah but... was just popping off. People are uh, <laughs> people were very upset about the uh, the, <laughs> the the what the Mudo title reign. It's like I don't know. I don't. I don't really have strong feelings on it either way. So I've kind of been like avoiding the. Uh, you know, the total, what you know, the total discourse on it. I guess it just really like, you know, it just really has not, uh, <laughs> it has not grabbed me either way. I guess because like I don't think 
I'm not like I don't think the Mudo title reign is gonna like fucking save the company. I don't think it's gonna tank the company. Uh, I'm very ambivalent on it. I just really don't care that much. So people are like freaking the fuck out though. Yeah, I think it. I yeah, say if anything, I think it's just gonna be same old, same old. I don't think it's gonna like kill the company or anything, but it's not gonna be as great yeah. as Ghost title reign, obviously. But I don't know, it's fine and. I was just surprised so many people well, thought Kaito was actually going to win. I figured he probably wasn't going to. But I guess we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. We'll see. I think he might still be the one to beat him eventually. Just a little early for that. I, I, unless Nosawa and Cyber Age were going to pay him a ton of yeah. money, I don't think Mudo is going to go and have a V0 reign. But but anyway, you know, check out our podcast. As mentioned, the One Nothing Podcast. You want to hear more stuff from me and uh my wife Kaylin. Alrighty, so but, folks, uh, that's of course, it for plugs for me uh you can follow us on twitter at wrestle omakase wrestling one fit uh we have the wrestling omakase patreon at patreon.com slash wrestling omakase uh where you can you know listen to our daily ongoing coverage of new japan cup next week here at back on the omakase free feed we'll be covering three shows once again this time it will be the new japan cup finals from march 21st the noah march 21st corican uh, which has the Kano uh, versus uh, oh god Kano versus uh, Iron Head uh, and Vegeta uh, no, GHC national title match and the All Japan March twenty first Kyoto KBS Hall show that we just talked about earlier with the uh, big Yoshi Tatsu title challenge. Uh, my guest will be Jerry Evans from Voice of Wrestling. She'll be coming back on, so that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, so Jerry and I will be covering those shows next week. Uh, In the meantime, folks, thank you as always for listening, and we will see you next time. For the ones who know safety isn't a catchphrase, it's a culture. And the ones who help make sure everyone makes it home safe. For the safety-minded who watch everyone's backs, Granger offers supplies and solutions for every industry, as well as safety assessments and training to keep your facilities safe and your people safer. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done.